For the global hazards topic, you need to know about a case study of a tectonic hazard. The tectonic hazard that we studied was the Nepal earthquake that took place in 2015. Nepal is a country located between India and China. Nepal has a population of around 30 million. The majority of those people are very poor, as can be seen from the fact that uh, most people earn around $730 in an entire year. This leads to a life expectancy of just 68. The capital city of Nepal is called Kathmandu. Here's a picture of the city of Kathmandu. It's located in a large valley surrounded by mountains. Many of the buildings aren't particularly well built, which means they're going to be vulnerable to collapse in an earthquake. Nepal is an extremely beautiful country, but actually 81% of the people live in rural areas rather than in big cities. As we shall see later, this means it's very hard to access many of the towns and villages located high up small mountain roads. For the exam, there's three main elements that they could ask you about your tectonic hazard. Causes, consequences and responses to the tectonic hazard. So let's start off with looking at the causes of the hazard. The causes of the Nepal earthquake are due to its location on the plate boundary between two huge tectonic plates, the Indian plate and the Eurasian plate. And these two plates are colliding together. After years of pressure building up, on the 25th of April 2015, the tectonic plates slipped. And that meant that all the energy built up on these plates pushing together was suddenly released in the form of seismic waves. And these seismic waves are what cause the ground to vibrate and shake, and we call that an earthquake. On the Richter scale, which is how we measure earthquakes, this was 7.8, and this means it was an extremely powerful earthquake. And unfortunately, Kathmandu, the main city, is located right on that boundary between the plates. Unfortunately for Nepal, it wasn't just one earthquake, but actually there were several aftershocks, one on the 26th of April and one on the 12th of May. And these aftershocks are extremely devastating because a building that might have already been damaged in the first earthquake might then com collapse completely in the aftershock. And so this earthquake event led to several impacts. So the next few slides are going to look at some of the impacts of the Nepal earthquake. One impact was that around 800,000 buildings, including many homes, were destroyed. This obviously led to knock-on effects, meaning many people were homeless. It ended up with people living in tents for several months after the earthquake had finished. Many churches, temples, historic monuments were all completely destroyed. The knock-on effect of this was, was no place for people to worship, and many of these sites were tourist attractions, and so this would mean in the medium to long term Nepal wouldn't be earning tourist money from tourists visiting these monuments. The earthquake triggered several secondary hazards. For example, there were 547 landslides and an avalanche was also triggered on Mount Everest. These landslides are incredibly dangerous in themselves, wiping out several villages. And in fact, the main base camp on Everest was completely destroyed. This image here captures the scene in Kathmandu where you can see that buildings have been in some places completely reduced to rubble. The people are picking through the rubble looking for survivors. Many hospitals were also damaged in the earthquake and this meant that there just simply weren't enough hospitals running to cope with the 22,000 people who were injured in the earthquake and this is why makeshift hospitals had to be set up on the streets of Kathmandu. Sadly, around 9,000 people were killed. The aftershocks have already been mentioned, and lots of people just couldn't get the medical treatment that they needed. Many of the roads were badly damaged in the earthquake, and many of the high mountain roads leading to many of the rural villages were destroyed or blocked by landslides. And so this meant it was extremely difficult for rescue workers or normal food supplies to, to reach many of the mountain villages and so in the medium to longer term many people died simply because they couldn't get the help that they needed. 
many areas of Nepal suffered power blackouts, meaning that people couldn't have lighting or heating or cooking. Having looked at the causes and the consequences of the hazard, we lastly now need to consider the responses to the hazard. And we need to think about if those responses were effective. Some of the short-term responses included that the UK gave £33 million in aid, which contributed to buying things like medical supplies, food, water and shelter for the homeless people. Japan, as an advanced country that's very used to dealing with large earthquakes, sent in search and rescue teams and they were involved in pulling many people out of the rubble who those people then survived. India also provided 50 tons of water and medical supplies. So there were positives. The biggest challenge that made the short-term efforts and responses ineffective was that it was very hard to reach those 81% of the population that were living in rural areas simply because the roads were cutting those areas off and it was very hard to reach lots of these people by helicopter. In the longer term, because it took Nepal so long to start rebuilding the buildings and the homes for people, many people had to stay living in tents such as these set up by the Red Cross. Red, the Red Cross was still in Nepal supporting the survivors more than three years later. One positive in the long term was that many of the Nepalese people were able to retrain as builders and to get jobs rebuilding the country's damaged infrastructure. Nepal has got loads of building projects happening even now, rebuilding roads, buildings, homes and bridges. And actually as they've been rebuilt, they've been built to better standards than they were before. Lastly, we can look at how technology can be used to mitigate for a tectonic hazard such as an earthquake. Some of the things that are affordable in both LIDCs and ACs include things like using sniffer dogs as part of a rescue team because those dogs can very quickly detect if there's a survivor buried beneath the rubble. Earthquake alarms are a simple way of warning people that the earthquake is about to start. Many schools in earthquake countries will practice drills whereby as soon as they hear the earthquake alarm everyone will get to a place of safety. Buildings can be strengthened by using cross bracing, for example, having a steel frame. In a poor country where steel might be too expensive, simply building the building's roof out of lightweight materials makes it safer. So if that building collapses, there's not as much weight of roof on top of you. People can be warned to have special go bags containing emergency supplies that they can grab very quickly in an emergency and it can keep them alive in the days after the disaster has happened. Some mitigation strategies are only really affordable in advanced countries such as Japan. In countries such as these, they make use of mobile phones and people will have apps like the eVigilo app, which will give them a warning direct to their phone if an earthquake is about to happen. Buildings can have clever design features such as a counterweight, which will counteract the swaying of the earthquake, the swaying of the building in the earthquake. The foundations of the building itself can have some kind of shock absorbing system to absorb the force of the shaking. The windows can be shatterproof. Gas supplies can be designed to automatically shut off in the event of an earthquake which will prevent fires. In fact in many advanced countries the gas pipes themselves are designed to flex in an earthquake so that the pipes don't get damaged. 